Okay, this morning we are going to be in Hebrews. We're looking at Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. Let's give our attention to God's Word. It says, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Bible says that all men are like grass, and that all of man's glory is like the flower of the field, and that the grass withers and flowers fade away. But God's word endures forever. So let me pray for us before we look at it further. Father, we do stop for a moment and ask you to be with us. Father, we recognize that you are the author of these words, and that you are a God who is so kind that you speak to us, that you reveal yourself to us. And so, Father, as the author of these words, we pray now that you will be with us as their great teacher and their applier, that you will be at work even, even now, be at work in spite of our distractions, in spite of our sin and shortcomings. Father, would, you, would your word be at work and open us up and change us? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one of my favorite comedians is uh, a guy named Brian Regan, you might be familiar with, and he has a routine that uh, he talks about. It's one of his uh, most well-known routines, and it's about what he calls uh, his, uh, his greatest social fantasy. And he says that he wishes that he could, he could be one of the 12 people that have ever walked on the moon. And he says he wishes he could be one of those people because it's the ultimate trump card in any social setting. Uh, he sets up his bit by talking about how people, how all of us really, we love to talk about ourselves. We look for any opportunity to jump in and tell our story that's just slightly better than the one before. Uh, he talks about how we, um, how we can often be the me monster. And he says the me monster looks and waits for the person to stop and tell their story. And then he says, that's nothing. Listen to this. And he says that he would, he would love to be able to let those people just go on and on about themselves, just take their story and run with it, and he'd just sit there and listen. And then as soon as they finished, he would drop the bombshell and say, I walked on the moon, and just let that hang. And the reason he says that that's his fantasy is because there's nothing that can top that. If stories have been one-upping each other, and then you drop the, I walked on the moon, it's over. Because it's, it's the ultimate. Nobody can stack up to that, no matter what they've done. And it makes everybody else just stop. And as silly, as somewhat silly as it might sound, that's actually a little bit of what the author of Hebrews is doing in this passage that we have uh, here before us. He's not doing it about himself, but about Jesus. He's about the business, uh, really, all through Hebrews, but particularly here in this passage of saying, Jesus is the ultimate, the supreme one, that there's nothing that can top him. And so that's really our uh, theme this morning, and, uh, and actually next week, we're going to take two weeks and look at this passage that Jesus is the ultimate, Jesus is the supreme one above everything else. Uh, a few semesters ago at RUF, I'm the RUF campus minister, um, we, looked at, we went through the book of Hebrews, and our theme every week was better than you can imagine. And that was our theme because the author of Hebrews is writing to a group of people, a group of Christians, primarily Jewish Christians, who are being tempted most likely because of uh, the persecution that they're facing, 
to, to, go, to bail on Christianity and go back to their Jewish roots. Uh, they're really wrestling with the question of what's so great about Jesus? Is Jesus really worth it? And so the author of Hebrews is writing this letter to show them that Jesus is better than anything you can imagine. Why in the world would you go back to, uh, to your old uh, Jewish ways when Jesus is so great? And so that's really, like I just said, the, the theme of the whole book of Hebrews. But especially here in these first few verses, uh, we get really the sort of the big picture, the 30,000 foot view, so to speak, where he sets the, the stage for the rest of the, the letter. And he basically says Jesus is the ultimate. He's supreme above everything. And so we are going to break this into two parts this week and next week. Uh, and this week we're going to look and see how Jesus is supreme uh, in three ways, three things about Jesus from this passage. Uh, we're going to see first that he is the inheritor, secondly that he is the creator, and thirdly that he's the representer. So first, we see that Jesus is the great inheritor. Look at verse 2. Uh, it's talking about, about Jesus. And it says, it refers to him as the son whom he, God, appointed the heir of all things. Jesus is the heir of all things. In the, in the ancient Near East, you have to keep in mind that the firstborn son was the inheritor of virtually everything. He got all the, all the stuff and was responsible for it. And our text is telling us that Jesus, as the son of God, is the, is the rightful and ultimate heir of absolutely everything that exists. Everything in the universe is rightfully his. Colossians 1.16 says that all things were created for him, for Jesus. Not just a lot of things, not just most of them, but everything that is, is rightfully his. All right, so what do we do with that? Well, there, there are no doubt a number of avenues that we could go down, and I want to I go down very briefly uh, three different avenues as we sort of try to apply this. So first, what do we do with it? Well, I think the first thing that we do with this, and this is going to be true really of all of these points this week and next week, there's a very real sense in which we don't do anything with it other than just stop and wonder at it. Um, that, that I think first and foremost, what we do is just stare at it. Just stare at who Jesus is and his enormity and his supremacy and the fact that he is the great inheritor of everything. We just, we just wonder at it, adore him. Let the enormity of who he is just, in a sense, just wash over you. I think there's a real sense in which we have to do that. Uh, a second avenue I want to go down. We need to see that it's not just the physical stuff. It's not just the things of the universe that Jesus inherits. It certainly does include all of the riches, all of the beauty of the universe, um, all of the resources. But the author is actually probably trying to get the readers, and, and certainly us, to bring to mind another aspect of the Messiah's inheritance, of what he's going to get. And that aspect of his inheritance is, is people. Now, where do we see that? We've got to do a little work to see that. Uh, if you look further down in, in the passage at verse 5, it says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, Today I have begotten you. Now that last part is a quote from Psalm, uh, Psalm 2, verse 7. And now Psalm 2 is one that the Jewish Christians would have recognized very readily as a, a what you would call a messianic psalm. That is a psalm that's not primarily about an earthly king, but about the, the one day someday king, about the Messiah. And so listen to the verse that's right after the one he quotes, Psalm 2.8. It says, Ask of me, 
and I will make the nations your inherit your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So do you see what that's saying? Psalm 2 verse 8. That that part of the Messiah's inheritance, what the ultimate king would get is his people. And so think about that for a second because I think it's really a An amazing aspect that I think will help make the fact that Jesus is the inheritor of everything really begin to come to life. Because what it means is that Jesus, who is the rightful heir of everything that exists in the universe, that really what what he looks at and gets excited about is me and you. That the aspect of his inheritance is not all of the land or the riches or the, the mountains, the, the fill in the blank. That what he gets excited about, what he looks at and feels, makes him feel wealthy, is me and you. It's his people. That that's what's truly val- most valuable to him. It's a beautiful thing. And the third avenue I want to go down uh, in relation to Jesus being the great inheritor uh, is this. That if, if everything really is created for him, that if everything is ultimately going to be owned, possessed by Jesus, then really everything in creation, and particularly you and I, we really only make sense in reference to Jesus. So in other words, the only way that you and I can really and truly understand ourselves, who we are, what we're built for, uh, the things that we do, the only way we can really understand ourselves is in relation to Jesus. Uh, One commentator that I read said it like this, everything in the universe has has its purpose and destiny in the air, Jesus Christ. So since our souls, since we are ultimately meant to be owned by Jesus, then it's our relationship to him is the only way that we're going to understand ourselves. I think you can think, give you an illustration. I think you can think about it a little bit like the goal line in football. Think about the goal line in, in, in football. Um, And hopefully we'll get to watch football in the months to come, but who knows? Every aspect of football, everything from recruiting to cheerleaders to coaching to quarterbacks and the plays, everything about it, it really only makes sense if you understand it in reference to the goal line, getting the ball across the goal line. If somehow you remove the goal line from the game, none of the other stuff makes sense. They're just random items, random aspects of something. So if you're an offensive lineman, how do you understand what you're supposed to, what are you supposed to do? Well, I'm supposed to block these people. I'm supposed to get in their way. Well, why are you supposed to get in their way? Well, I'm supposed to get in their way so that they can't get to my quarterback or running back. Well, why do you want them to not get to the quarterback or running back? Well, so that they can uh, advance the ball down the field. Why do you want to advance the ball down the field? Well, we want to advance the ball down the field to get closer to and ultimately cross the goal line. And somehow every aspect of football traces back to that. And so because everything, including you and I, have as our ultimate destiny being being the inheritance of Jesus, then he's kind of like that goal line. We only make sense of who we are and what we do in relation to him. So for example, we'll try to bring that home. Because of these times, because of COVID and quarantine and whatnot, you very well might be feeling incredibly lonely. You might have been feeling that way well before uh, quarantine. But maybe in these times, you, you feel incredibly lonely. And, it, and it's hard, and it hurts, and it's painful. Well, why is it so painful? Well, it's painful because, because you're built in the image of God. 
You're built in the image of God who is eternally in relationship as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, designed to operate and flourish best in relationship. And when that's not there, it, there's dysfunction. It hurts. And really, the only thing that can truly begin to heal that pain is, is to see that you've been brought into the ultimate relationship that you have fellowship with God in and through Jesus Christ. And now, our our human relationships are are a taste of that relationship. And when we don't have them, there's dysfunction. When we were talking, uh, when I was doing this with our students, um, I, I got them to think about their grades, so why, why are our students so often so overwhelmed and panicked uh, by their grades? Uh, for you, you know, whatever, what is it that, that, that does that to you? Maybe it's your work, your job performance, your performance as a, uh, as a mom or a dad, whatever it is. Why do we get so overwhelmed by those things? Well, it's because we all want to know that we're, we're valuable, that we're worth something, that we matter. We want something, we, we want to look to something that tells us that we're okay. And if it's our grades or our job performance or, or whatever, then we're only going to be as good as that thing says that we are. If it's your grades, you're only going to be as good as your grade. If it's your performance as a father or a mother or whatever, it's, it's only going to be as good as you perceive your kids to be. And it's overwhelming. But we're actually designed to find, to find our real value, which is an incredible value, uh, in what God says about us in Christ. And it's what we just talked about, that we're his prized possession. So, that, I mean, we could go on and on seeing how everything about us only makes sense, really only makes sense in Jesus. But we need to keep moving. So we see that Jesus is the the ultimate inheritor. Secondly, we see in our passage that he is also the creator. Look at verse 2. Again, speaking about Jesus, of course, it says, Through whom also he, God, created the world. He's not only the inheritor of everything created, but he's actually the one that created it. Or maybe better said, he's the agent of creation. John 1, 3 says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So everything that exists in the universe exists because of Jesus. Just try and let your mind catch up to that for a second. And, and of course it's virtually impossible because we can't even begin to fathom the size of the universe. But, but let's try for a second. As I was working on this, I did what any, you know, red-blooded American would do, which is Google it and look it up on YouTube, try to figure out, all right, how do I begin to think about the size of the universe? And so I went down that, you know how it goes, you go down that wormhole of videos on YouTube, and it was actually pretty fascinating. I saw one about the, um, about the Hubble telescope, and it said that the Hubble telescope took a picture of what seemed to be a very dark and empty uh, part of space, a very small slice. And the video said to understand how small of a slice of space, it said, um, take your finger and, and hold it out from you as far as you can and point up at the sky and imagine a grain of sand, one grain of sand on the end of your finger. The amount of space that that grain of sand covers up is the size uh, into which the Hubble telescope took a picture. So incredibly small. And here's what it found. 10,000 galaxies. Just in that small slice, there seemed to be nothing there. 10,000 galaxies. Scientists estimate that there are... um, a hundred billion galaxies with each galaxy having a hundred billion stars and each star potentially having planets around it. 
like our own solar system. It said that that would mean that there are more stars in the visible universe than there are grains of sand on the entire earth. It's, a, it's incredible to begin to think about. Just try to wrap your mind around how enormous it is. And, and Jesus created every bit of it. It's amazing. He created every bit of it just by speaking. It's incredible power. And again, the first application, what do you do with that? You don't do anything with it except sit and wonder. Just sit and be awed by Jesus. The enorm his enormity, his power. But it also seems uh, very fair to say that that this means, that it means more than the, just the bare fact that Jesus created the things in the universe. Um, actually, the Greek word that we translate world here is actually one that we get the word um, eons from. Uh, it's one that we often translate as ages. Um, you know, some sort of era of time. One commentator said it's the sum of the periods of time and all that is manifest in them. So in other words, it's not just the material things of the universe, what we can see and touch, but it's everything that happens inside of them. That everything that happens somehow owes, it, owes its existence to Jesus. And we could say it this way, that Jesus creates by his providence that Jesus is sovereign over everything that happens. And look, as we begin to apply that, I, I, that probably, or no doubt, brings up a ton of questions, a ton of potential problems. And I, I get that. We don't have time to go into those, really. But, but I want you to think about, go back to what we said about these, the original hearers. These Hebrew Christians were facing persecution, they were suffering a lot because of believing in Jesus. And they were beginning to, to think, is, is Jesus really that great? Is Jesus really worth all this? So can't you imagine how this reality would begin to make them think differently? That if this really is true about Jesus, that he created all the stuff and he's in charge of everything that happens, then certainly he can take care of me. Certainly he's big enough to take care of us. That Jesus is bigger than everything, anything and everything that happens to us. So what about us? I think especially now, <laughs> we can begin to, to appreciate, to to long for this to be true and, and to, to enjoy the fact that it is true. The author of Hebrews wants us to see just how big and powerful and in control Jesus is. Because honestly, the other stuff often feels so much bigger. COVID feels so big. And it is big. But it's not bigger than Jesus. Jesus. And it didn't happen outside of his control. And again, I get that that's problematic, and, and we'd love to talk to you about that sometime. But having to figure out schooling for my kids and what, what to do and what's right, it, it's overwhelming and it feels, it feels too big. But it's not bigger than Jesus. So whatever it is for you, Right When you feel like there is nothing that can overcome my loneliness, there is nothing that's gonna, that can overcome my depression or my addiction or the shame that I feel or the anger that I have or the sin in my life, it's too far gone, I'm too messed up. There's nothing that can be big enough 
Those things are too big. Hebrews comes along. God comes along and says, no, that's not true. I know it feels like those things are way too big, but I want you to see Jesus is way bigger. Jesus is enormous in his power, in his sovereignty. Jesus created everything and he's big enough. And that's good news. That's good news that we need to drink in and rest in. But thirdly and finally, uh, we need to see from this passage that Jesus is the representer. And that's a terrible title for our third point. It's the best I could do. Jesus is (laughs) the representer. And we get that from verse 3. Look at verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And a lot, of, a lot of folks, a lot of preachers, commentators will break this up and look at it separately. We're going we're to look at it together. That Jesus is the radiance of God, uh, the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. Um, I think we could sum it up like this, that Jesus manifests God to us. Jesus is how we understand God. Uh, a lot of, uh, you can... I've heard people say it this way, Jesus explains God to us because he is God. He's God in the flesh. He's the radiance of God's glory. That's what we get a glimpse of, of what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus takes Peter and James and John. He goes up on the mountain and all of a sudden Jesus begins to to shine. Uh, It's as if the the curtain is being pulled back and Jesus' true glory is, is Uh, able to shine through. Uh, His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white. And God's voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. What was happening was, was we were, they were seeing the real radiance of God's glory. Just a little taste of it. They were seeing that Jesus has the same glory as God God the Father. The idea that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature, uh, the word for imprint there uh, is the word used for, uh, what, for what a seal or, or a stamp would create, the imprint. Uh, how you would take you know, metal and put it into a form and, and make an impression on it. Or maybe how uh, some sort of seal, like a, a ring, would be dipped in wax and, 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 impre- and press down on the paper. Well, the impression that's left uh, corresponds to or is the exact, the exact reflection of the, the stamp or the seal. And so our text is saying that Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father. It's much like what John 1 1 says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? How can something how can he be with God and be God at the same time? Because Jesus is 100 percent God and 100 percent man. Uh, he and the Father are of the same substance. They're, they're made of the same stuff. Yet they are distinct from one another. Jesus is not the Father, but he represents the Father perfectly. All right, so what does that mean for us as we we finish here? It means that if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Because Jesus is exactly what God is like. So what's your view? What's your view of God? You know, maybe if you read the Old Testament and you think that God, uh, you think that God is mean and temperamental and, and angry, he loves to zap people, um, then you need to see that, that God is like Jesus. Jesus is like God. Um, a lot of us probably default to thinking about who God is like, what God is like, um, the same way we think about uh, a police car that, that got behind us in traffic. Probably, if, if you're like me, uh, your default is to thinking that police car is watching you like a hawk. And he's almost hoping you're going to mess up. He's certainly watching you, and if you do mess up, 
He's going to nail you as soon as you do. And I think we can tend to think about God like that. Um, I heard a pastor friend of mine say that he grew up with the belief, uh, his default belief about God was that God was just always super angry at people, at sinners. And that eventually one day he just got so sick of them and, and hated them so much that he hurled the sort of lightning bolt of judgment down to earth and Jesus jumped in front of it and took judgment on himself so that now God can't be mad at us anymore, even though he really kind of would rather be mad at us. So what picture of God do you have? Because the right picture of God is Jesus. So what's that picture? This is what we're going to end with. What is that picture? Well, it's a picture. It's a God that loves sinners. He doesn't love sin, but he loves sinners. So much so that he gave up the thing that was most valuable to him. He gave up his son. That Jesus shows us a God that loves us so much. That wants to be with us so badly that he goes to, to the greatest lengths imaginable to make that happen. A God that pledges himself it really weds himself to people that have rejected him. And he shows un, almost unbelievable grace and mercy to people like that. To people that have looked at God and said, no thanks. I'd rather be on my own. I don't need you. I don't care about you. And God, has, God has, has worked to bring those people, people like me and people like you, to bring people like that in. And that's the good news of the gospel. That's the true God. That's the God that's supreme over everything. Even the hard things the one that's supreme over everything in every way is one that loves you the, and one that invites you to come to him. Even this morning, he invites you to come to him and to come for free. That's the good news of the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. Won't you take it this morning? Maybe even for the first time. Let me pray for us.